This is a picture of the original 13 colonies. Why did people such as the pilgrims choose to leave England and start a new life in North America? This is the Declaration of Independence. Why did the colonists decide to declare independence from England? This is a picture of the Louisiana Purchase. Why did President Jefferson make this purchase? And who already lived in this area? This is Lewis and Clark. What do you remember about the expedition of Lewis and Clark? So after the Lewis and Clark expedition, the United States continued to grow and become more crowded in the East. More and more people decided to move westward to the frontier, looking for open land and new opportunities. So you learned about the word frontier in our um, fairy tales and tall tales domain. So frontier can mean two things. It can be a boundary or the edge of a country or land, but it can also describe the unexplored areas of a country or place. What was known as the frontier during the time of westward expansion or growth was the area west of the Mississippi River, where more and more people moved and settled. We call the people who first settled in new areas of the frontier pioneers. So many of the tall tales that we heard were set in this time period. So for the next couple of weeks, we'll be learning about westward expansion and the exciting innovations or new ideas prompted by a country spreading westward including the invention of steamboats, the building of the Erie Canal, the operation of the Pony Express, and the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. So we'll also learn about the hardship and tra tragedy westward expansion call caused for both pioneers and Native Americans. So this is the map of the United States. This is north, headed this way, east, south, and then west. This is the west coast, right through here. We're actually in Washington, but this is the west coast. So when we talk about the westward movement, this means movement toward the west. So they're coming from this way and going that way. So they're moving to the west. And then expansion means that it's making the country bigger toward the west. So when we say westward expansion, it's making the country bigger toward the west. Here's a picture of Paul Bunyan, and this is a picture of Pecos Bill. So where was Pecos Bill's family moving? And why did his family want to move west? And what did they travel in? Why did Paul Bunyan clear the land in the Midwest? What natural landmarks did Paul Bunyan supposedly create? I want you to listen carefully to learn about the experiences another family has had as they move westward. The family in the next read aloud is fictional, but based on real people in our country who moved westward in the 1800s. Have you ever gone on a long trip with your family? Did you get bored during that long trip? Did you ask that famous question, which all parents love to hear, are we there yet? Well, let me tell you, it could have been much worse. You could have been going west in the 1800s. In those days, there were no cars. You would have traveled in a covered wagon like the one shown here. So these were called prairie schooners because they were like ships sailing ac across the prairie. The wagon covers looked like the ship's sails. Your wagon would have been pulled by horses, mules, or oxen. You and your family would have bumped along unpaved, dusty roads. You would have traveled all day long, and it would have taken you about six months to get from the east to the west. Does that sound like fun to you? Actually, your trip may have been even harder. Your family would have had to pack everything you owned into a wagon, including personal belongings, clothing, food, water, and supplies. So there wouldn't have even been room for you to ride in the wagon. So they packed their belongings into wooden trunks and put the trunks into the wagon. So you may have had to walk all the way to Oregon. In the 1840s and 50s, tens of thousands of Americans went west in wagon trains. What do you think a wagon train is? These pioneers hoped to make a better life for themselves. Many of them were eager to claim farmland in Oregon or California. They left many of their friends and family behind, loaded everything they had into a wagon, and set off for the west. What were the people who moved west called? The following story tells about what it was like to make the trip west. 
Unlike some ancient civilizations that we learned about in which we got most of our information from archaeologists, this account is based on records that people left behind, such as diaries and journals. In this account, the Morgan family makes the trip from Indiana to Oregon. The Morgans were farmers. They hoped to start a new life in Oregon. This is their story. The Morgans left for Oregon in April of 1846. They had a single wagon loaded with all of their belongings. Can you imagine trying to fit everything your family owns into a covered wagon? Mrs. Morgan and the young children rode in the, in the wagon. The older children walked alongside. They also helped herd the cows that trailed along behind the wagon. On the first day of their journey, the Morgans traveled 14 miles. When the sun began to set, they set up camp. The boys gathered wood for the campfire, and a campfire is an outdoor fire used for warmth or cooking. Then Mrs. Morgan cooked supper. After supper, Mrs. Morgan set up beds for the children in the wagon. Once the children were asleep, she lit a candle and wrote the first entry in a journal she had decided to keep. April 11, 1846, began our journey to Oregon, made 14 miles in our first day. The sun felt warm upon our skin as we made our way along. Our journey was brightened by the wild flowers that dotted the landscape. By the time we made camp, the older children were exhausted from walking. I have to admit that I gave them each a little rot. I have to admit that I gave them each a little extra stew for supper tonight. For the next few weeks, the Morgans traveled west across Indiana and Illinois. They rose early each morning and traveled until just before sundown. On their good days, they covered 20 miles. When it rained or the roads were bad, they covered fewer. Today, our cars can take us more than 65 miles in an hour. So 25 or 20 miles in one day is not a lot, is it? That might be from here to not even Post Falls. About one month after starting their journey, the Morgans reached the Mississippi River. They hired a ferry to carry them, their wagon, and their animals across the river. On that day, Mrs. Morgan had a lot to write in her journal. This is some of what she wrote. May 10, 1846. The great Mississippi is wider than I could ever have imagined. Our wagon, our horses, and our supplies were loaded onto a flatboat and carried across the mighty Mississippi. I held my breath as I watched all our earthly possessions float away. Another month later, the Morgans reached St. Joseph, Missouri, where they bought food and supplies. The next morning, they crossed the Missouri River. This meant they were leaving the United States and were entering the area people called Indian Territory. On this day, Mrs. Morgan wrote in her journal, June 5, 1846. The children are hoping to see Indians. We have been told that the Cheyenne and the Pawnee live in the area we are traveling through. We have heard that they are sometimes willing to trade horses and food for clothes and tobacco. This map shows the Oregon Trail. It was a 2,000 mile wagon trail that ran from Missouri to the Pacific Ocean. A few days later, the Morgans turned onto the main road to Oregon, known as the Oregon Trail. There were many other settlers traveling, traveling along this road. The Morgans joined up with a group of more than 100 settlers traveling to Oregon. By mid-June, the wagon train was crossing the Great Plains. On all sides, they saw vast open fields of grass without a tree in sight. The Morgans also began to see large herds of buffalo. They noticed that these magnificent creatures spent much of their time with their heads bowed, grazing on the abundant grass. On one moonlit June night, as the stars sparkled in the sky, Mr. Morgan shot a buffalo, and Mrs. Morgan cooked the meat for supper. On that night, Mrs. Morgan wrote in her journal, June 14, 1846, buffalo meat, although tasty, takes a lot of chewing. I watched the children eat as the flames from the flickering fire lit their dirty faces. The good thing was that while they were chewing, they weren't complaining. A few days later, the Morgan's wagon broke. Mrs. Morgan stood guard all night in the rain while Mr. Morgan fixed the wagon. What was she watching for? Two weeks later, something even worse happened. Eight of the oxen that pulled the Morgan's wagon vanished during the night. The Morgans searched for the animals but could not find them. They hitched up some of their cows instead, but these animals were not used to pulling a wagon, and the Morgans made slow progress until they could get better animals. In mid-July, the Morgans reached Chimney Rock in what is now Nebraska. 
You can see Chimney Rock in this photograph. While admiring the sights, and these are things or places you see, Mrs. Morgan and a friend almost got caught in a hailstorm. This is what Mrs. Morgan had to say about this adventure that evening in her journal. July 15, 1846. We are making much slower progress. Yesterday we only covered 11 miles. We were delighted to see Chimney Rock, but we had the most dreadful hailstorm. Mrs. Peterson and I were pelted by hailstones the size of small rocks. The hailstones tore some of the wagon covers off, broke some boughs, and scared several of the oxen away. A few days later, the wagon train reached Fort Laramie, another common landmark on the trip for pioneers heading west. Two weeks later, they crossed the Rocky Mountains. Mrs. Morgan wrote, August 9, 1846. We wound our way over the mountains along a very crooked road. Had rain and hail today, which made it a very disagreeable experience. However, Papa and I smiled so as not to discourage the children. In late August, the Morgans traveled across a, a dry, dusty desert. Mrs. Morgan wrote that the dustiness was like nothing her friends in the East had ever seen. August 30, 1846. My friends back East know nothing about dust. This dust makes it impossible for us to see where we are going. We cannot even see the oxen that pull our wagon. The cattle struggle to breathe, and we have the taste of the dusty air in our mouths all the time. When the children go to sleep, every one of them is covered in a layer of dust. In mid-September, the Morgans encountered some Native Americans on their journey. Mrs. Morgan wrote, September 14, 1846, the Native Americans along Snake River wear only a cloth tied around their hips. They have few horses and no blankets. The immigrants are happy to trade them old clothes for fish. Toward the end of September, a young woman in the Morgan's party decided she had had enough of the Oregon Trail. She sat down on the side of the trail and claimed that she could not travel any farther. Then she began to sob loudly. The Morgans felt sympathy, or sorry, for her, but there was nothing else to do but to press on. In mid-November, the Morgans reached Fort Dalles, Oregon, on the banks of the Columbia River. Oregon in November is quite cold. They built a raft that would carry them and their things down the river. Unfortunately, it, it had been raining for several days. The river was flooded and running too fast for raft travel. The Morgans had to wait for several days by the riverside. It was cold, rainy, and windy. The family huddled around the campfire to try to stay warm. Mrs. Morgan recorded two entries while they waited for the weather to improve. November 14, 1846. We are unable to move forward. We must wait for the wind to ease. We have one day's provisions left. The warm sunshine has abandoned us, and we are chilled to the bone. November 16, 1846. No let up in the weather. If anything, it is worse. Waves rise up, rise up over our simple raft. It is so very cold that icicles hang down from the wagon. On all sides we see vast open fields of grass without a tree in sight. Finally, the Morgans were able to make their way down the river into the Willamette Valley of Oregon. This painting shows what an Oregon town looked like at the time. Unfortunately, toward the end of the trip, Mr. Morgan had fallen ill. Mrs. Morgan rented a tiny house in Portland, and with the help of some kind men, the Morgans moved into the tiny house for the winter. Mrs. Morgan sold their last possessions to buy food. Mr. Morgan was so sick he could not get out of bed. Some of the children got sick as well. Many people during that time got sick because of unsanitary conditions and lack of medical care. Mrs. Morgan was so busy caring for her family that she stopped writing in her journal for a while. In mid-February, she started writing again. February 13, 1846. It rains constantly. Our house is cold and the roof leaks badly. It is difficult to keep our spirits up. We are only able to eat one good meal a day. We still dream of our new home in Oregon. I know we will get there. Mr. Morgan recovered, and in the spring, the Morgan family settled, and that means they moved there and made it their home, on a farm in Oregon. The Morgan family's journey ended well, though for many others who traveled west, it did not. So the next time you're on a long trip, thinking how boring and terrible it is, think of the Morgans and their trip to Oregon, and remember, it could be worse.
was going west in this read aloud? How did they travel? What did they take with them? Why did they want to move west? Was life easy or difficult once they settled in Oregon? How do you know? Would you have liked to have been a part of a pioneer family going to the West? Why or why not? In today's read aloud, you heard, while admiring the sights, Mrs. Morgan and a friend almost got caught in a hailstorm. Say the word sights with me. Sights. Sights are things or places seen. We saw many beautiful sights as we traveled down the Mississippi River. What's the word we've been talking about? Sights. 